I'd like to start with a little Polly Wolly Doodle. And I believe that I live in a society that is full of intrigue and counterploy. And to get through that society, I need a certain degree of intelligence. And they say that there are certain types of intelligence. There's intelligence that helps us to understand and act appropriately. And they say that that's excellent. But they also say that there's a better form of intelligence. That is the intelligence that discerns what others know and act appropriately. Now, unfortunately, we seem to live in a society where we have to fit into the current wisdom of the day. We have to conform. Now, sometimes I ask myself, how do we create the current wisdom of the day? And this is done by a system of neuro-linguistic programming. And there seem to be four components to this. The first is misinformation. That is information which in the final analysis is quite often not correct. They follow up with very large amounts of disinformation. Disinformation is correct, but it's difficult to synthesize the data and draw proper conclusions. They then use a technique in the third leg called rebuttal techniques. That is how to give plausible answers to difficult questions. And finally, the fourth leg is importuning techniques. Importuning techniques is where you frighten people unnecessarily. And this can be done very simply. For instance, I as a surgeon can hold up a mammogram or an x-ray and say, that's probably a cancer. I have literally scared the wits out of that patient. That patient will not be able to think or act coherently. It's like a form of hypnosis. Now these systems are unfortunately taught in our universities and our higher centers of learning. The name of the course is called marketing. It's how you sell a product or how you sell an idea. Now, Every person who comes along to you at these meetings, I think, is a conflict of interest. And I certainly have a conflict of interest because I am interested in the business of surgery. There's a very famous pathologist once called Karl Rokotansky. And when the young doctors were qualified, he always got them into a room. And he said to them, Look, you're now fully qualified doctors. You're going out to practice medicine. But you will never really understand medicine and you will never really understand some of your colleagues unless you understand five facts. These five facts are, it's a business, it's a business, it's a business. If you're perceived to do it well, you have a good business. If you're perceived to do it poorly, you have a bad business. <coughs> Now, when you go along to the doctor with a complaint, the first thing he does is he takes a history of your complaint. And then he takes a past history. What illnesses have you had in your past life? And then he'll do a patient profile. That is, what's happening in your family? Is there a family history? Secondly, what's your occupation? We know certain occupations like, like welders and so forth, very high incidence of cancer of the lung. And then he'll ask you about your habits. And some habits cause problems. For instance, smoking causes problems. And then after that, he'll do systematic questioning for every, each system in the body. Following this, he will examine you. And the first thing he'll do is he'll examine you generally. And then he'll cone down on the system that you're complaining of. And when he's examining you, he does four things basically. He looks, he inspects. The next thing he does is he feels, he palpates. Then he percusses. And then he puts on a stethoscope and he listens, he auscultates. And basically what he's doing is he's collecting signs. Now frequently there's conflict between the symptoms 
and the signs. And the basic rule is that you must always follow the signs. The signs are most important. Now, I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but after he has done his examination of you generally and of your chest and so forth, he'll order tests. Now, basically what we need is composite information. Remember, some of your tests may give you a false positive and some of your tests may give you a false negative. Now, today I'm going to talk to you about cancer. Cancer of an internal organ at an early stage is very hard to diagnose. And yet it's very easy to cure. You simply send that patient to a surgeon and he cuts out all the cancer and the cancer is cured. On the other hand, cancer at an advanced stage is very easy to diagnose and it's very difficult to cure. So, I'd like to talk to you today a little about cancer of the lung. Just some background. I qualified in the Matter Hospital in Belfast and generally speaking, we qualified five or six doctors each year. My year was the largest ever in the Matter Hospital in Belfast. We qualified 10 doctors. First job I had was in the Belfast City Hospital. The next job I had was in the Royal Victoria Hospital. The Royal Victoria Hospital is the largest hospital in this country. I left there and then I went to Our Lady's Hospital for sick children in Crumlin and I worked there for a few years and then I left Our Lady's Hospital for sick children in Crumlin and I went to the Mayo Clinic for a few years and after that I went to London and I was lecturing cardiothoracic surgeon at the London Hospital, the London Medical School, and then I stopped medicine. I threw it up for about six months, and then I came back, and I worked at the Richmond Hospital in Dublin, and uh, also uh, in St. Vincent's Hospital, and that's where I finally ended up. <coughs> when you go to your doctor, with a chest, with a cancer of the lung, you may have no symptoms. You may just have lethargy, not feeling well. But generally speaking, you will have respiratory symptoms. You'll have a cough, you'll have ex excess sputum, you'll have, have hemoptysis, or you'll have blood in the spit. And sometimes you'll go along, and the reason you go to your doctor is because you're complaining of metastasis. Metastasis is a big word meaning secondary tumours in other organs. Or sometimes you may have these uncommon non-metastatic tumours. Cancers of the lung may mimic any cellular type in the body. They may mimic skin type cells or gland type cells. Similarly, cancers of the body may produce substances that will cause syndromes in the body that are most unusual. And I'll start with these. Sometimes a small cancer may cause a Cushing syndrome. The person will get fat face and a buffalo hump and a lot of weight on the body and so forth. Sometimes, we won't go over them all, a squamous cell cancer can cause hyperparathyroid syndromes affecting the calcium metabolism in the bone. Sometimes undifferentiated tumours can produce female hormones and you get men coming in developing breasts. Sometimes they can affect the nerves or the muscles and this is called neuromyopathy. Sometimes it can produce abnormal growth hormones people will start growing the ends of the bones. The, the joints will become very red and swollen and painful. Sometimes it can produce dermatomyositis. Sometimes it can produce abnormal pigmentation of the skins. Sometimes it can even produce non-bacterial endocarditis, little vegetations 
on the valves in the heart. And basically what I'm saying to you is a lung cancer can literally do anything. Now, the appropriate management, these slides, by the way, are more than 40 years old. Uh, generally speaking, uh, what we do is we do x-rays and we see an opacity. And if you have an old x-ray to compare with your recent x-ray, and there's a, this is a new opacity, that's a great lead. CT scans were just coming in at this stage. We use CT scans every day of the week now. And basically with a CT scan, you're literally cutting slices of the body and observing the images. Do sputum examination. We do cytology. That means we're looking for cells. And in Ireland, at that time, there was still a lot of tuberculosis. We also look for ZN stain. That's to show up TB. And then we do a gram stain for non-specific bacteria and fungi. Then we'd go on to our more specialised investigations. And we'd look down into the lung with a special instrument. And if we see the lesion, we take a biopsy. And if we can't see it, what we do is we'd run a tiny little, like a chimney sweeps brush out there and take brushings. And we'd put those brushings on a slide and the pathologist would look for abnormal cells, abnormal fungi and TB and bacteria and so forth. And at the same time, after we had done that, when the patient was still asleep, I'd do a mediastinoscopy. I'll describe this to you later. That's literally where I put a little cut in the neck and go down the outside of the windpipe and uh, pick up the nodes. Now, we were using markers, chorionic, embryonic, antigen, FP, and HCG, and so forth at that time. Those markers, markers they're not really satisfactory. They're, they're not very good, and we have better markers now. At That's a slide showing finger clubbing. It's not a very good slide. I'll show it to you later, better. Now, the overall tranapletement is we find that 75% of the people that we see are inoperable. There's no point in doing surgery. 25% appear to be operable but we're only curing 35% of those people. In other words, if somebody walks in the door with a cancer of the lung, there's a 9 or 10% chance that I can offer that person a cure. And then we do a variety of resections. Say we can take out a segment or a lobe or a sleeve. I'll describe this later on. Or we can take out the whole lung. We call that pneumonectomy. Now, in it, that's from the surgical point of view. And then we sent most of these patients on to a radio oncologist and they, in appropriate cases, give radiotherapy, chemotherapy and biological therapy. Sometimes we just treat the patient symptomatically. If he's got pain, we treat the pain. If he's got asthma, we treat the asthma. If he's got a chest infection, we treat the chest infection or treat the anemia. Just try and improve him symptomatically. Most of the advances that are coming through at the moment seem to be in the biological area. First thing I've got to do is look at the patient generally. What's he like generally? What age is he? Is he 99 or is he 49? Or what's his general overall clinical status? Do you know, is he fit for surgery? Then the next thing I've got to do is I've got to stage him. I've got to say, is this an early cancer or is it a late cancer? And then I've got to look at the cell type. And generally speaking, if you run into what's known as a small cell cancer, and they make up about 20% of the cancers, there's no point in doing surgery because those, those uh, tumors have generally spread all over the place. As I said earlier, 75% of the patients we see are inoperable, 25% are operable, but we only cure about one third of them. Now, because we've got to stage the patient, we have to examine other organs in the body. We have to do scans of the brain, the bone, and the liver. 
to see if there are secondary tumours there. We've got to do CAT scans of the chest and the abdomen and sometimes of the brain. If we see a lesion and we can't biopsy it, some people go ahead and needle biopsy it. I never liked that technique. And sometimes when we see a tumour there and the tests are not showing the appropriate results, sometimes we have to just literally resort to thoracotomy and go in and take out what appears to be a tumour. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that these tumours sometimes do is they produce abnormal growth hormones. And we think that this is finger clubbing. You notice that the ends of the fingers are like little matchsticks. And that's, this is a, quite a common phenomenon. That is where the tumour is producing some form of abnormal growth hormone that is affecting the tips of the fingers. By the way, there are a small group of people in the community who were born with finger clubbing. So if you go home and you find your finger club, you may have been born that way. But if it's recently acquired finger clubbing, it's very important. As I said earlier, these tumours can literally do anything. Here is the foot of a patient presented with dermatitis caused by a substance produced by the tumour. Picture of a hand showing dermatitis, particularly along the little finger. Again, this is a, something that the tumour is producing, affecting the skin. <clears throat> this is an example of a person who's got hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, fancy word to say that he's producing growth hormones and his bones are growing again. And here we see new layers of bone being laid down on the edge of the tibia. And I have operated on people like that and you see them with grossly swollen, tender joints. And you'd go back and you see them a few hours later. You see the red, shiny joint was now a dull pink color and it was wrinkled. The, the mere fact that you've removed the tumour that's producing the hormone that's producing this problem it can have a very dramatic effect very quickly. Could we darken down, please? <coughs> no. Sorry, thank you very much. This is an x-ray of a patient. This is the right side. The other side's the left side. This is the heart. Now, normally your right lung is 55% of the volume and the left lung is 45% of the volume. You notice that the left lung on this side is larger than the right lung. The second thing you notice at the top of the right lung here the lung is collapsed. There's obviously a tumour somewhere in here. <coughs> this is a CAT scan. We've literally cut the person in half. And in the right side, this is the right side, by the way, the uh, middle lobe is collapsed. There's something blocking the entrance to the middle lobe. This is an x-ray of a patient who had a breast tumour and we have radiologists who are sitting all day, each day, looking at these x-rays and they'll pick these things up like a shot. There's a little spot here and there's a little spot there. They're little secondary tumours from a breast. Now, normally your mediastinum is just about the width of my tie, but you see here the mediastinum is the area between the two lungs. You see there's a huge collection of tissue there. That's a large collection of metastatic lymph nodes. Those are lymph nodes that are full of tumour. You see the windpipe just here. And you see the tumour. <coughs> this is looking at a patient sideways. The, this is the front of the patient over here, in the back. 
and there's two shadows there. There's a circular shadow here, and then there's a shadow behind it. And that was the tumour of the right lower lobe, just overlying the heart. Now, having seen the image and known where the problem is in the lung, the next thing we do is we look down into the lungs. And we use, these are the old-fashioned bronchoscopes. And the bronchoscope is basically a metal tube and uh, into that metal tube is an airway. So as I'm look, when I'm looking, the anaesthetist uh, can respire the patient. By the way, these metal tubes, you need to put the patient to sleep. And then we have various telescopes. Some of them let us look forward, and some of them let us look to one side. And similarly, biopsy forceps that let us take it at an angle or straight ahead. And sometimes we can't take a biopsy so this is a little brush and we take a we put the brush down and we brush it in the suspicious area hoping to pick up abnormal cells or abnormal fungi or abnormal bacteria this is what you see when you look down a bronchoscope and here you can see this is the left lung and the right lung and this is the middle or the carina now if we put a telescope down, you see the telescope there in the, on the left hand side of the screen, it lets you look sideways up the uh, bronchi to the left upper lobe. Sorry, to the right upper lobe, things are the opposite way around. This is what a cancer looks like in, in A and B, something which you virtually never see, a little polypoid tumour. Now, one of the advantages of, this, of the fiber optic scope is you can put this scope in with the patient awake but the, and uh, <coughs> you don't need to anesthetize the patient. But the problem is that the biopsies that you take are tiny. They're about one twentieth the size of the biopsies that you'd get with the rigid scope. And in this occasion, I put a, a brush down and you take the brush, you see the edge of the brush coming out of the end of the scope. We have a map of the bronchial tree and it's like Grafton Street is this street and etc. etc. Each little branch has a name, you know. I know where if it's in the middle lobe, I know to go straight to this to this uh, bronchus, you know. At the same time as doing a bronchoscopy, I always did a mediastinoscopy. It meant that you only had to give the patient one anesthetic. And basically a mediastinoscope is a metal tube about that length and uh, it's got a very powerful light in it. And down through that metal tube we can put a suction diathermy. So this little suction allows us to suck out any secretions or blood and at the same time, if there are any little bleeding spots, I just touch the pedal with my foot and it will literally coagulate the bleeding spot. And this is the biopsy forcep that we used. And it, they take uh, large biopsies. I'll show you an example of these. Now, this is how we actually do it. You look at the top left-hand side, you see that there's a sandbag under the patient's shoulders. His head is hyperextended. I then make a little cut in his neck and I cut down to the windpipe and then I put my finger in. The safest knife you'll ever have or safest scalpel you'll ever have is your finger and I make a tunnel down here and there's no tunnel and then down that tunnel I put the, uh, the scope Here's the tunnel being made, and here's the scope. Now, one of the things about surgery is basically a surgeon is a hand worker. Sir is the word for hand, and eon is the word for worker. We are basically hand workers. And uh, people used to ask me, how do, you f how do you find these nodes? I feel them. It's like 
feel your cheek that's normal but feel your nose that's the difference between a normal tissue and tumor tissue it's just as simple as that and obviously anywhere I'm suspicious of I feel I go in and I biopsy and I take 10 or 20 biopsies and it's a rigid scope that's the front of the patient to the right the posterior to this side I cannot get in there that's the heart and that's the anterior medial sinus it's a rigid scope I'm working in this region sorry for all the I'm a, is there a pointer here no Don't, I'll go on now. it's all right don't worry I'm nearly finished thank you very much which one oh, the, the red one at the top just this one? one yeah that's just for pointing yes I'm working in that area there and as I said I, I'm working behind the heart that's the heart and then that's the fat above the heart I can't get in there because the scope is rigid and these are the kind of biopsies that I take and generally what I do is uh, I take a whole lot of these biopsies that's an old Irish penny it's not a cent by the way uh, just to give you an idea of the size of the biopsies and uh, I think uh, uh, some of these biopsies I sent to uh, Professor Kleins and he was able to culture them man sent to me by a dentist he took out his tooth and here there's a this is where the tooth came out but that's a tumor we x-rayed his chest that mattered a cancer of the lung so there's nothing we can do surgically for a patient like that this gentleman was sent to me he was suffering from depression and you notice his face is very blue his neck is swollen, his, his arms and hands were swollen. He had superior vena cava obstruction. And 98 times out of 100, that's caused by tumor nodes. He and luckily turned out to have a, a condition called mediastinal fibrosis, benign condition. Now, I went over certain syndromes that the, the, uh, tumors could cause by hormones and antibodies and so forth that they're producing there are anatomical syndromes that tumors produce if the tumor grows into the superior sympathetic nerves the patient will come in with ptosis or the eyelid <coughs> will be falling we call that Horner syndrome sometimes they come in with ferocious pain in the shoulder and down the arm that's where the tumor has grown into the top of the brachial plexus the the nerves going to the arm and the hand sometimes they have a superior vena cava syndrome as, as I've just shown you sometimes they have hoarseness because the tumor has grown into the recurrent laryngeal nerve particularly on the left side sometimes they have paralyzed the diaphragm that's called phrenic paralysis and occasionally you'll find evidence of pleural effusions and the effusion can cause an anatomical syndrome now 75% of the tumor spread goes to the local nodes that's why we're so interested in doing a media sinoscopy 30% of the tumors eventually end up in the liver and 20% end up in the bones, the adrenals, the kidneys, and the brain. So that's why we investigate these organs before surgery. The adrenals are little glands on top of the kidneys, the very rich blood supply. And why the tumors grow there so frequently into a small organ, I'm not sure. <coughs> now, the different kinds of tumors behave in different ways when they come to you first, you first see them squamous cell carcinoma at least a third of them have spread outside the chest adenocarcinoma have even more uh, spread or uh, early metastases as we call them and small cell cancer at least 90 percent of them have spread diffusely throughout the body we then have a fourth kind of tumor and that's an alveolar cell cancer 
Normally what happens in the cancer is the cancer starts in one site and spreads all over the place. So there seems to be one site of origin. On the other hand, in a alveolar cell tumour, there seems to be a soil change in the lung. And you may get four or five tumours arising de novo in different parts of the lung at the same time. International staging varies every number of years. Occult cancer is a very difficult type of cancer to manage. That's where you're picking up tumour cells in the sputum and you don't know where they come from. You've just got to keep after these patients, keep investigating them until you find the exact source. Carcinoma in situ is basically stage zero. As a surgeon, I'm interested in anything up to stage two. Stage one, I can cure about 90%. Stage two, 60%. If it goes to 3A, there are a few of those we might be able to pick out. But generally speaking, we're wasting our time. And by the way, the tumor staging is based on this tumor size and position. That's T. The nodes are the nodes, whether they're nodes in the lung or there are nodes in the mediastinum or elsewhere. And then metastasis, that's distal spread of the tumour. And ven generally speaking, where there's a metastasis anywhere, uh, the tumour is stage four. Example of stage one. On the left hand side, or your right hand side there, you see a small coin lesion in the upper lung. If I take that out, there's a 90% chance I can cure it. Similarly, for a T2, even though I have to take out a piece of the chest wall, I can cure up to 90% of those. If it's stage two, I can cure the patient even if I have to take out a small portion of the chest wall. The nodes are involved here as well, usually. But these are intrapulmonary nodes. In other words, when I'm taking away the lung, I'm taking away the nodes. So. 60% cure in that. Stage 3A, they say you can cure 5% of these patients. I'm not sure. You pick up the occasional case that you can get surprisingly good results in. But if the tumours have spread to the mediastinum at all, or if the tumour has spread to any vital structure, the tumour is generally inoperable. Here's a T4. It's a tumour and uh, you see the size of the tumour has gone into vital structure and you also see the nodes are involved. You're wasting your time doing surgery there. These are some tumours that are T3. Tumour size does not seem to be as important as we used to think and if you, there are a small group of these patients, about 5%, if you do a chest wall resection or if you resect the vessels going to the arm and the nerves going to the arm, you leave your patient with a certain disability but you can cure them. But it's a very small group of patients. This is a patient who comes in, you see in his face, his right eyelid is drooping. You see his pain written in his face. He's holding his arm, he's obviously got a lot of pain down the right arm. He got a chest x-ray done here, and the chest x-ray shows an opacity at the top of the right lung. That's the diagram showing where the tumour is at the top of the lung, and that's growing into the nerves that are going down the arm. Very, very few of these are curable. They get very good results with radiotherapy, you know, especially for pain relief. Another tumour, I've shown you an example of this, it's the tumour here is grown into the vena cava and it's the big vein coming down from the head, neck and arms and it's blocked it. <coughs> you, you can do nothing for that tumour. Like maybe radiotherapy and chemotherapy will relieve it but certainly surgery is no rule. Once the nodes are involved in the mediastinum or in the neck, as in this diagram and the media sign, you're wasting your time. This is systemic disease. 
certainly surgery has no role. If we're taking out a whole lung, we call that pneumonectomy. If we're taking out a lobe, we call that lobectomy. If we're, if we're taking out a lobe plus part of the main bronchus, and we'll join that up to that, that's called a sleeve resection. And rarely we do segmental resections, little take the segment of the lung out. Now, as I said earlier, tumor size is not important as we thought it was. Here we're comparing T2 with T3 with no nodes involved. And you see that the long-term results are fairly good. They're excellent actually, and there's not much difference between the two. Now, most of the patients go for form, some other form of treatment. Radiotherapy professor Moriarty will tell you a lot more about that than I could. Chemotherapy, we seem to be using less chemotherapy nowadays and using more biological therapy. But recently, in the past four or five years, we have made significant advances, particularly in the biological field. But still, many of the patients need to be treated simply symptomatically, treat their pain, their chest infection, their anemia, and so forth. This was a form of treatment which was popular about 40 or 50 years ago. And basically what we do is we put a, a tube down and this is the tumour. And then down that we put radon seeds and we'd radiate the tumour. It became popular for a while and uh, it's called brachytherapy. And in lung surgery it has died out but it's coming back again. Maybe the better systems nowadays. This is a lady, a, a surgeon can spread the tumour. This is a lady that I did a media sinoscopy on and she had a little cut in her neck. And you see in the cut in the neck you have a tumour growing and growing rapidly. So surgery can spread the tumour as well as cure it. This is a specimen of a tumour and you see the bronchus it's been split open this is after it's taken out of the patient and you can see the tumour another case we've taken a lobe out and I've split the tumour and you see the tumour tissue is nice and clean and so forth whereas the lung and so forth looks quite dirty that's the normal bit this is the abnormal bit Another case of a lung tumour that I've taken out and it shows something that you see frequently in tumours. You see pus. The centre of the tumours tend to outgrow their blood supply and become necrotic. Uh, as I said earlier, there are various histological types. Squamous cell carcinoma, in other words, skin-like. Adenocarcinoma, gland-like. Undifferentiated tumours. They're not mimicking any tissue in the body. And then there's the bronchoalveolar type, which I'll show you examples of these now. And then we have adenomas. And the reason I put the adenomas in, sometimes the adenomas turn into cancers. And they can either turn into a carcinoid tumor or a cylindroma. Now, this is a, a non large cell undifferentiated tumor. You see some of the tumor cells are huge. Some of them are tiny. They're all shapes and sizes. It's difficult to make head nor tail of this, but uh, an experienced pathologist will pick this up immediately. So that's a large cell, undifferentiated tumor. This is a small cell cancer. These little things here, they're normal mucous glands. All the black area, that's all tumor. Small, chem, small cell tumour. Normally, if it's a fast-growing one, it'll kill you in eight weeks. And if it's a slow-growing one, it'll kill you in 16 weeks. And if you give them chemotherapy, well, you get maybe 15 months a year out of it. Or 15 months or a little longer. But it's a lethal kind of tumour. Generally, there's no point in operating on these people. 
This is an alveolar cell tumour. The lung is made up of little air sacs. And here's a little air sac. And you see, they're little made up of little flat cells. You see that cells are cuboidal cells. And you see in the centre of the alveolus, you see mucin. And it's re repeated all over the place. This is a tumour that has multicentric origin. Doesn't or uh, it doesn't start in just one centre. It starts in a whole lot of centres at one time. This is a squamous cell cancer. It's unusual because it's got what we call epithelial spurs. But if you look at this carefully, this is the main part of the tumour. And uh, One of the specimens that I sent to Professor Plines, he's produced extraordinary results from it. He had a young lady called McBride, and she was looking at these tumour cells, and apparently she came to him after a period of time, and she said, look, I see three kinds of cells there. It says, I see cells that are just a little spiky, cells that have an intermediate degree of spikiness, and cells that are maximally spiky in it. So Professor said to her, all right, separate them out. And she separated out the minimally spiky, which were about 67%, and the intermediately spiky, which were about 25%, and they grew them separately. And then they started growing, doing various tests on them. And they do various tests like growth assays, motility assays, invasion assays, and so forth. And they found that these cells that were intermediately spiky, invaded 10 times faster through the membranes. So the cell was then producing something abnormal. So then what they did was they filtered off the cells and compared the media with, with the different kinds of cells. And they found that metalloprotein 2, metalloprotein 10, fibronectin, viomentin, and breast cancer proteins were much more abundant in the uh, intermediately spiky cells. So I think that when we're dealing with a cancer, we're dealing with a family of cells. And just as no man is an island, you're affected by the people around you. I think that these cancer cells, no cancer cell is an island. It seems to be affected by the, the cells around. And as far as I know, what they did was they transferred the minimally spiky to the intermediately spiky media. And the cell shape did not really change much, but the cells became much more invasive. So I think that's the kind of work that really has to be followed up. <coughs> this is a clear cell cancer. These are like kidney type of cells. And you see, these, these tumors are all completely different. You know, completely, they look completely different. <coughs> we won't go over that, it's too complex. <coughs> this is a picture of that man I showed you earlier. You see the veins in his neck standing out. This is the syndrome caused by the blockage of the superior vena cava. When I'm doing a mediastinoscopy, that's the windpipe. I'm working in that area there. It looks a very dangerous area between all these big vessels. But instead of choosing sharp instruments, if you use your finger, you can get down there quite sa safely. This was a Naruki map designed by a Japanese uh, surgeon. And I disagree with him. He, he, he gave the various nodes different scores. The green ones had zero score. These ones had uh, one score and so forth. I believe any node that you pick up in the mediastinum, particularly here, is the same as a red node. Once the mediastinal nodes are involved, it's basically, from the surgical point of view, inoperable. Sometimes we get benign syndromes mimicking surgery, and I had four cases of mediastinal, three cases of mediastinal fibrosis, and one case of superior vena cava thrombosis. <clears throat> As I said, this lecture was originally, I gave it in early 1970s, and that was the data at that stage. And you see, stomach cancer, 
in the men and some cancer in women falling all the time lung cancer in men way up lung cancer in women much less but in the last 40 50 years women have started smoking and this figure has literally gone up and Finbar has put in this next slide this is the only modern slide I have and you see over the years people are smoking it used to be that more than 50% uh, of men smoked now it's down to 27% and it used to be that it was mainly men that smoked and not women and you see that in men the incidence of cancer of the lung is slowly falling but you see in women the incidence of the cancer of the lung is increasing men smoke for a different reason to women men smoke to be the big filler whereas women smoke to suppress their appetite that's what I think anyway Sometimes you see a dramatic case, like this man has come in. This is a much more common syndrome than people realise. You see, he can't open his eyes, can hardly open his mouth, face swollen up, chest swollen up, looks very dramatic. It's very easy to treat that. You simply cut a hole in the skin and the air gets out and he collapses down to normal. It looks very dramatic. It's occasionally seen with cancer. It's more commonly seen with pneumothorax. Sometimes you can get a surprise. This patient was sent to me from Jervis Street Hospital, I'm sure most of you don't remember where that is. It's now in Beaumont, it's part of Beaumont. And the patient had a large shadow in the right lung. And I did all the tests and I couldn't find anything. So I operated on the patient. The patient's head is up here, feet down here. This is the normal lung. Here's what looks like a tumour. It's not a tumour. He had a hole in his diaphragm and part of his liver had herniated through. So I just cut the hole in the diaphragm, pushed the liver back and sewed it up. He's perfect. <coughs> so all that looks like a tumour may not be a tumour. And this is just the difference between a peripheral tumour and a central tumour. I think I'll finish there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Anybody questions? I, I have two questions. Thanks very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I remember when I trained as a student nurse, um, I remember scrubbing for a, a, it was a pneumonectomy, and uh, the surgeon just, I, I noticed the lungs, that they were so black, and the surgeon said, oh, that's just from living in Dublin. Um, that there was an awful lot of pollution in the lungs and I just wondered mm. in your lifetime of looking well, at lungs on the inside that's do true you see a difference in the true. pollution in Dublin true anybody who is, lives in a city has lungs like that oh, yeah. and especially if they smoke they're pure black yeah. okay. and your second question I'm sure there has been an, an improvement since Clubbing, the clubbing yes. presentation, and I, I know that the people can have with chronic obstructive airways disease yes. or even cardiac disease can present with clubbing. Yes. Would you? I just don't know enough about clubbing. And um, would you be able to talk a little? Yeah. Bit well, about you can get clubbing. clubbing with other conditions. First of all, the clubbing may be normal if they've had it all their lives. You can get clubbing associated with liver disease, or you can get it with uh, COAD. And there are a variety of conditions that cause the clubbing. What actually produces the clubbing, we don't know. We think it's some form, abnormal form of growth hormone. We don't really know. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Clubbing looks like this. It improves after surgery as well. If you remove the tumor, you showed us an example of the bone settling down very quickly. You remember the mm -hmm. type of clubbing. Does the clubbing improve as well after surgery? Does so you, it? you remove the tumour, does the clubbing... I think it improves. I, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure about that point, Michael. Yeah, no, you might know more about it than no, me. No, no, I but I, I think it improves. As well, yeah. But uh, well, it's obviously some sort of hormone or chemical. Yeah. Mm. Yes, but if it's a hormone or it's an antibody mm. or something mm. that, that the tumour is 
uh, producing and you remove the tumour, the, the changes you can get are dramatic, Amazing, yeah. absolutely yeah. dramatic. One case sticks out in my mind. I went along to a man and he was cowering under the bedclothes and he had a small tumour in his left lower lung and his, his skin was red and wet and all around the bed was like at the bottom of a Christmas tree. This was the skin that he was literally shedding off. And uh, I bronchoscoped him and I mediastinoscoped him and I said, are you wise? You know, will his wounds heal? He went back to them the next day. The wound was completely healed. I operated on him and I took out a small tumour. It was quite easy to take out. His skin went back completely to normal. It was simply amazing. Mm. You do not see many of those tumours. Whether the tumour is producing an antibody or a hormone or an antigen or anything, that doesn't alter its operability or its curability. Sure. Whereas the staging procedure really does. Can I ask um, a general question just about surgery? Um, my daughter had first surgery when she was 10 and just, she had a cystic fibroma. So just about actual surgery and how you do that for her injuries or her fibromas up here so they had to take it out so do you spread the ribs out and how do you actually physically get in to do that to take a lung she, out she had to go into her chest to yeah. take out the, the cystic hygromas that i have seen they've been able to remove locally well generally what you do is you go in through the fifth or the sixth space Okay. And obviously if it's up near the top, you'll go into the fifth. Sometimes you might go into the fourth. Okay. Just spread the ribs out, collapse the lungs and go in and take it out. So if you're taking out a lung, then do you collapse? Do you just spread out the ribs, is it? Yes. Yeah? Okay. And uh, the lung will, c the anaesthetist will collapse the lung for you. He'll use what's known as a special kind of Carolyn's tube. Okay. And that uh, enables him to respire the patient on just one lung. Okay. And he'll respire the patient on the opposite lung to the lung that you're right. using, okay. you, that you're working on. Yeah. So it makes it easy for you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm asking, do you keep abreast of the latest, um, the latest things coming, coming out, technologies, etc. Are you excited at all with the way technology is advancing? Do you think well, it's going to help? There has been no major advance that I know of in surgery in the past 40 or 50 years. There have been advances in Professor Moriarty's it's field. the key old stuff, though. Well, uh, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned. Uh, I, I introduced the keyhole surgery and chest surgery here in Ireland in the mid-80s. The general surgeons had been using it three or four years beforehand. I found there was no use in tumours. It's all right if you're doing a blebectomy or you're doing a little wedge resection of lung or something like that. Uh, I don't. I think it's. I think personally, I feel it's been overplayed. Instead of making one incision, you have to make three or four. Mm -hmm. You know, they're small ones. But then, uh, intuitive surgery, they control it. They're selling what's known as the Da Vinci system, and this system costs you two or three million pounds to install. We have it, you know, it's lying in the hospital. And the yeah. other thing about it is, Michael, during surgery, we use disposables. I'd use about 100 or maybe 120 euros worth of disposables. When you're using the Da Vinci system, that's you're robot, using it. Robot yeah, robotic. You're using at least 1,000 euros worth of disposables. If you lift, a, lift a scissors, they don't call them scissors, by the way, they call them shears. That, that's 150 euro. If you put in a suction, that costs you 60 or 70 euro. If you uh, use a stapler, it costs you 350 euro, and every time you reload it, another 50 euro. You're bundling up money like nobody's business. You know, and they're encouraging you to use these systems. And uh, quite honestly, using robotic techniques you cannot replace the human hand. I find those little tumours with my fingers. I feel them. I I'll, I'll feel tumours that you will not pick up in an ordinary x-ray or a CAT scan. I will feel them. And uh, the finest instruments you'll ever have are your own hands. 
maybe I'm biased, but uh, and the other thing about it is using that intuitive type of surgery, uh, it'll take you three or four times as long. So there's a place for both, but I feel in tumor surgery it does not have a role. That's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. You mentioned the alveolar tumors as being multivocal. So yeah. Is, is there any suggestion what's happening there? Could it be viral or? Well, we, we don't know. Don't what know. they say is there's a soil change in the lung. Mm. And apart from that, I can't really answer. Are those tumors associated with any particular environmental stimulus like asbestos or anything? No? Not that I know. No. Okay. Maybe so, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, there is a tenfold increase in ordinary lung tumours, squamous and adeno and so forth, and undifferentiated in people who are exposed to asbestos. A tenfold increase. And that's not, there's also increase in the number of tumours in the coverings of the lungs in those people. We call those, uh, what do you call those tumours? Mesotheliomas. Yes, yeah. And the alveolar <coughs> tumours are they squamous or? Adeno. They're adeno. Okay. Okay. So they come directly from the, from the lining of the alveoli. Yeah, the, the cells in the alveoli seem to change mm. into adeno type of cells. Okay. And they also behave in other ways like an adenocarcinoma in that they secrete mucus. Yeah. <laughs>